Thank you, Griffin. We just we have the happiest musicians I've ever seen. <laughs> Should have seen them warming up today. They were having a blast. Uh, so I'm trying to think, you know, I wonder what kind of big, hairy problems we all have. Uh, maybe things that are coming up. It's a good day to think about them because we want to think about them in the light of Christ. But we're going to hear a story about uh, the children of Israel going through the Jordan River. And uh, Lord helps them pass through. But uh, it's good when we're thinking about that to think about also the times that the Lord's gotten us through hassles or difficulties. So I would invite you as we're reading through the text, we are really blessed by this text today. It's been great for me just to be reading over it this week because think about too the times you look back when the Lord's carried you through things that you thought, oh, how am I ever going to get through that? You know, we've been, we've been praying for the folks in the Carolinas and it's been weird. What was unusual to me is that they could see that hurricane coming three days two days, one day, boom. Well, sometimes that's how problems come upon us. And we see them out there, and they're ominous, and we know they're getting closer, and we know they're getting closer. That's a rough time. But uh, sometimes a barrier might seem impossible and impassable. And that's kind of the situation that the children of Israel had. Uh, thinking about getting through something. Sometimes you get through, you go through a, a problem or a difficulty and you emerge really victorious. And you go, that was great. There's a great quote on that. If I, that well, there you go. Nothing, nothing in life is so exhilarating as to be shot at without result. <laughs> From a good hearty soldier. And as we think about why these things were written down in the Old Testament, New Testament gives us a good light on that. This is Romans 15.4, and it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So as we look at how this whole nation, maybe a million, probably over a million people, were confronted with this raging river between them and the promised land, we might look at whatever it is breathing down our neck or out in the horizon before us. Or maybe there's something out there, we don't even see it yet, but the Lord knows it's out there. And the Lord, uh, with his help, he says, uh, Paul says, look, I can endure all things. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you that you're a, you're a God that tells us uh, to be courageous. And you're a God that says, follow me. And you're a God that tells us, be strong and follow me. So we ask that as we come to your word today, that we will, that your Holy Spirit will, will move in our hearts to help us see maybe some things that seem ominous to us, from your divine perspective. Lord, help us to uh, interact with this word as we're thinking about it and processing it. And maybe even as I, as I bring up foreboding problems in the future, uh, those thoughts can just give us anxious thoughts, Lord. And we pray that you would remove those anxious thoughts, that you remind us that, that uh, in this world we will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Jesus, you've overcome the world. Amen. So we come to our text now. This is Joshua. Remember, he had sent the spies over. They were able to get forward around the, the river. And then uh, he's got to get everybody on the other side of the river. And early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped. And before crossing over, after three days, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and we notice the Lord is capitalized, so it's the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah, or Jehovah, or Yahweh, your God, and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance 
of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Now, when we think of this ark, uh, you might think of the Raiders of the Lost Ark and that artifact they were looking for. Well, that's an amazing artifact that God told Moses to build this box and cover it with gold. And then it's what they placed in the box that makes it really clear to those who, who love the New Testament what this Ark of the Covenant represented. Here's what's inside. I got a cutaway shot here. But what was kept in the Ark as a memorial to the people was the laws, the tablets of the, of the Ten Commandments. And there's only one person that ever fulfilled those Ten Commandments. And there's a gold jar of manna. You know, it's amazing, the manna that God would feed the people supernaturally every day. And, and Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And then there's the staff of Aaron that even though it was a staff, it was growing and budding. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And so we can think of this as just as a symbol or a foreshadow of God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. And this was the earthly representation of God with the children of Israel. This is where he would come through his spirit and meet them oftentimes in a pillar of fire or a pillar of smoke. And uh, he would meet them on this Ark of the Covenant. That's the Ark of an Agreement. And on the very top was the mercy seat. And remember at the end of John, when we saw that the disciples had gone into the, into the empty tomb, and then when, the, when Mary went in later, she saw two angels, one on each side of where his body had laid. And so there we see the mercy seat with two angels on it. And we go, this is where we receive mercy. And so it's interesting. They were told to stay about a half a mile away. Don't all crowd it. Keep your distance. And there is a sense in the Old Testament that the holiness of God is being impressed on the people. Don't even step on the holy mountain or you will die. And now, don't get too close. Don't come within a half a mile. One thing that's interesting about that is when God does this amazing miracle where he leads them in across the Jordan, everybody can see it. <laughs> he says, stay, uh, you know, keep your distance. You've not been this way before. You want to see where you're going. And so if they had all crowded in, people would have just been following the crowd. But he wants to show them, look, this is where the way you're going to go, and you've never done this before. And that's an amazing time of anticipation because it all started back with Abraham. He got a, a covenant. And the, what was in the covenant? That he would have a seed that would bless all the nations, and he would receive land. So he had to leave his father and mother and go out, and uh, there was a high cost. And then they went back into Egypt, and they had 400 years of bondage. Then with Moses, they're set free. They don't have the faith to move right into the promised land, so they spend another 40 years meandering through the wilderness. And now they're finally ready to come into the land, but there's a raging river as an obstacle before they can take the promised land. And last week, we, we mentioned, too, that the promised land is not such a good metaphor for heaven, where there's going to be, you know, no struggles, and the Lord's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes, there'd be no, no more death. It's a better more metaphor for the Christian who comes out of bondage into new life, but still has to take the land, still has to walk in the good works that he has preordained for us that we might walk in them. So to take the promised land is a struggle. And in this life, there is a benefit to risk, to spiritual risk. I love the fact that uh, Greg was sharing about his doing a, a Christian devotional at the church, but with his mom and dad. That's a risky thing to do a devotional with your family. It takes risk. You might have a little panic button. Do I want to, do I, do I dare uh, elevate these relationships? Of course, it's what we want. We want that kind of closeness with our family. We want that kind of fellowship. 
Maybe, you know, there's like a relationship that you know you have to call somebody out, speak the truth in love. But there's a risk. But the promised land is all about risk. And knowing that if we're doing what we're called to do, he's, he's going with us. In fact, he goes before us. So the, the word here is follow the Ark of the Covenant. When you see it, you follow it. And, and he's got the plan. And they don't. <laughs> and they've just spent three days camped out in front of the Jordan River. And we're told later on in the text that it was at full flood stage. So they're camping out, and they're hearing the, the, the sloshing and the twirling of the river. And maybe as the river bank is swelled, they're hearing, maybe they'll hear a cr uh, the crack of a tree or a branch that succumbs to the, to, the, to the river. And they're thinking, how are we going to do this? And, I, you know, we got our little babies, and they've been shepherds in the wilderness. Who knows how to swim? How are we going to get across this? And they're thinking about, you know, 40 years, maybe we should have been building an ark. But here they are, all these people, families, women, children, kids, and their livestock, and the river is at full flood stage. And you're thinking, you know, I just spent, we just spent 40 years out there. Don't you think we could just wait half a year to when the river's real low? That'd be my plan. You can see it, but I can't. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the, the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of Israel. So they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priest to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, excuse me. Tell the priest who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. So this is a big day. This is momentous. <laughs> this is momentous. This is the last barrier between entering the promised land. And he says, now, tells all the people, go and consecrate yourselves. What does that mean? How are we going to consecrate ourselves? Sanctify yourselves. Kind of set yourselves apart for this holy purpose. Sanctify yourselves. Um, I think this is analogous to Christians when we confess our sins and we take communion. When we have unconfessed sins, we're still children of God and our sins are forgiven. But our unconfessed sins and our rebellious hearts break up our fellowship with God. We read a lot about this in 1 John. Those, those sins we don't want to let go of ruin our fellowship with God. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It's like that cleansing. Remember uh, Peter in the upper room when Jesus wanted to wash his feet? And he says, no, 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 you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus says, no, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. And he says, well, then wash my head and my hands and everything else. Too. And Jesus says, no, no, no. So anyone who's clean just needs to wash their feet. And then he says, and you're all clean, except for one of you, meaning Judas. So he's saying, look, as Christians, we're all clean. But he wanted to wash his feet, meaning we need a, we need a cleansing, like a day by day, because we're trudging through the dirt all the time. So, uh, so this is what they had to do. They had to set their heart. They, they had to set themselves apart from all the usual concerns of the day. I bet they fasted. I bet they prayed. I bet they had some ritual washings that they, that they did. But what do you do? 
they're getting ready to uh, to move past this big obstacle. I think about what do I do before I have a a, a big contest. I watched the movie Creed this week. It was on TV. You know, or I think you might think about what football players do before the game. They, they, you know, they try to get their heads in the game and they, they make sure their reflexes are fast, but that's not what they're told to do. <laughs> they're, not, they're not working on their stroke. <laughs> no, just focus on the, on the Lord. Be still. Focus on the Lord. Tomorrow, you're going to see what the Lord's going to do. And he tells Joshua, because this is so important. Now, most of these people, maybe some of the older folks, the 50, 60-year-olds, that's as old as they got. Anybody older than that, except for Caleb and Joshua, they left in the wilderness. They buried their bodies in the wilderness. But maybe the 40, I guess 40, 50, 60-year-olds, they would have had childhood memories of going through the Red Sea. But probably most of the people were younger, and they just heard the stories of going through the Red Sea. And they saw manna every morning, and it didn't even seem weird to them. Like, hey, that's just how life goes. You know, like, the first time you saw a video screen on a telephone, whoa! <clears throat> now I hardly think about it. But I still don't know anything how it works. Right? But I just expect, if it doesn't come on, it's like, hey, what's wrong with this thing? So they're just used to seeing manna every day. It's like a miracle every day. They probably hardly don't even recognize it's a miracle. Boy, that's easy, isn't it? So, uh, so now they're getting now they're they're really going to be tested, and they're going to have this opportunity to see Joshua. And Joshua's, you know, he's been groomed for this for forty years, and now they're going to see: is this going to work? They're all urging him, be strong and courageous. God's urging him, be strong and courageous. But is God going to speak and work through Joshua the way that he spoke and worked through Moses? It's kind of like this is our first trial run. Whether God's going to lead them into the promised land or not. This is so weird. It's totally normal to you, but on my screen, it's like half one slide and half the other. Let's see. So I'm reading off that back thing, and it's kind of like when you go in the eye doctor and they switch. I want to make sure I got the right one. Sorry about this. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here. And listen to the words of the Lord, and the, that's Jehovah, your God. This is how you will know the living God is among you. And he will certainly drive out before you the, Can uh, the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Gergeshites, Pepsi Light, I can't see what that, Amorites, and the Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of the earth, the, the Ark of the Lord Jehovah, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So now they've spent three days. Then they had an extra day to know it was coming. Now they're, now they're being told, okay, this is a game plan. They've been, they've been ruminating over this. How are we going to get through this? Are my kids going to make it? Am I going to know how to swim? What about the livestock? And now they're told, this is what the Lord's going to do. And all they have to do is show up. All they have to do is line up the priests, and then the priests have to go and actually step in the water. That's a step of faith. That's a pretty big deal. Joshua has to be believing this is all going to happen. Or he's going to, you know, if they stepped in the water and nothing happened, they would, their hearts would just fall. That'd be it. 
But when they step in the water, they're told this is what's going to happen. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. This is uh, all their planning, all their scheming about how they were going to maybe get over this, this river. They didn't need to do any of it. They just had to trust in what the Lord had told them to do. They had to trust, okay, there's more information. We're, we, we're marching down to the, to the river, but they still don't know the plan. But you know they're thinking of their own plans. Proverbs tells us, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. So our text says, It, the water, piled up in a heap, a great distance away, at a town called Adam, in the vicinity of Zarathan, of Zarathan, while the water, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So on the little map there, you can see there's three red dots. And the top one is Adam. That's where the water was cut off. That's about 15 miles upriver from where they're crossing. So they didn't even see that. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground. While all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. It says the whole nation, but it's really not the whole nation. And in the next chapter, you'll see, because if you look at the map that's up there, you'll see that there's three, na there's three tribes. The half tribe of Manasseh, and uh, I forgot which it is. Gad, anybody else know the other one? What is it? Manasseh, the half. Manasseh, Gad, and there's one more. Could be Reuben. I think that's likely. Anyway, three of them, but if you read the beginning of, of Joshua 4, you'd know that they sent out 40,000 40, soldiers. So of those, of those three tribes, 40,000 went over. 40,000 soldiers. That, that, just think of the logistics of this group going through the wilderness. That's just the soldiers. So that, it's likely there's a million people that walked across the Jordan on dry ground. What a great connection to their heritage. This is what God did for Moses. And now such a similar miracle to remind you, hey, look, God is speaking through Joshua. In each of these, uh, God speaks to Joshua, then Joshua makes a command, and then the people do it. This is what's so different than the experience of the generation before. The generation before, God would speak to Moses, Moses would speak to the people, and the people would grumble <laughs> and think about going back to slavery. Now this generation, the generation that grew up seeing the miracles of God, and grew up seeing the punishment of God on their elders. They are ready. And so uh, there's a leader that's full of the Holy Spirit, and the people are full of the Holy Spirit. Everybody has a heart to serve the Lord. That's why I compare this, or, or, or maybe it's a bad comparison, but that's why I would call this is the greatest generation for the Jews, where they take all this land, and they see the victory of the Lord, and the victory is the Lord is doing, and they're just obeying. I'm going to hop into uh, Joshua 4 today and uh, just skip down a few verses. That day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him all the days of his life, just as they stood in awe of Moses. And remember, Joshua is a type of Christ, and the hero is not Joshua, and the symbol is the ark, which is God with us. Then the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests carrying the ark of the covenant law 
to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. And the priests came up out of the river, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set feet, set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to the place and ran at flood stage as before. You know, years ago, I went to um, Universal Studio. I haven't been there probably for 30 years, maybe longer. But when I was a kid, I remember going and they had a flash flood. Anybody remember this? Raise your hand if you remember this. It was kind of weak, but they, they kind of drove the tram up and then there was like this dry gully and they turned the faucet on, whatever it was. And this flash flood came and it's knocking down trees and it looks like it's going to come and hit the whole tram, but it goes away. But that's just like minuscule. But that's what I was thinking of. I don't know if you've ever seen a, a real flash flood. Maybe you've seen one in life. Maybe you've seen one on TV. But man, you hear that thing coming. <laughs> and I would imagine that's what it was like. Like before they stepped out of that, they probably heard that thing. And they're carrying it out. And then it comes like a truck when a, when a flash flood comes through. And I'm just picturing this thing just comes bouncing off the walls just as they were taken out. A perfect, perfectly timed miracle of God that he held back the water. And Joshua set up at, uh, set up at Gileg the 12 stones. So he told the one man from each tribe to go in, and while they were in the middle of the Jordan, take a large stone and put it on your shoulder. So you got the biggest guys from each tribe, and they grabbed the biggest stones they can find, and they carried up. And then they carried up to, to Gilgal, and he assembles them and stacks them up, the 12 stones that they had taken out of the Jordan. And he said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? This is what they did that was so important. And this is the greatest memorial I could even ever imagine. What a great documentation. Here's these, uh, uh, you know, these river-swept stones and the testimony of those who carried them up. We got that on dry ground in the middle of that river and ask your parents about it. And so a beautiful monument. But if you look ahead, it's kind of a frightening part about this. If you look after Joshua and the book of Judges, they didn't communicate it very well to their kids. And lest we shake our heads too much, <laughs> we think of the, of the wonderful legacy of our country and the monuments of our country and the Christian heritage of our country, and it makes me swallow hard. And I know it wasn't handed to me. It wasn't handed to me. I, it wasn't until I got out of school that I had to unlearn a lot of misinformation about the founding of this nation. But uh, we can do that, and we can make sure we give it to our kids. But they were told to ask their parents. So parents need to go, this is my obligation to tell about the, the amazing nation, what the Lord has done in the nation of Israel, and that's our obligation too. And we shouldn't expect it in the schools. There was a time that the schools did. There was a time when schools talked about the founding documents. But they're very Christian-based. Tell them. Tell them what happened. Tell them the history. Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry, dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. And the Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we crossed over. And he did this, two reasons now, he did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. It's a good thing to fear the Lord God. And uh, it, sometimes we get so casual in our, in our faith. And he is relatable. And, he, and we are invited in the, New Nest, uh, in the New Testament, draw near to the throne of grace with confidence 
But it also says, look, it's a fearful, it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So uh, it's great that Jesus says, I call you friends. But it's also good to know that we're going to stand before him one day. This was a big day. In fact, they wrote a song about this. Oh, and I don't know if I can read this from here, but I'll try. because. But they wrote this song. I don't know when they wrote this song, but, it, but uh, this is Psalm 114. And it says, The sea looked and fled, and the Jordan turned back. The mountains leaped like rams, and the hills like lambs. Why was, it, why was it sea that you fled? Why, Jordan, did you turn back? Why, mountains, did you leap like rams, you hills like the lambs? Tremble, earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool, the hard rock into springs of water. And later, Paul tells us, or maybe it's Hebrews, tells us that that rock was Christ. It's amazing when we look at the contents of the Ark of the Covenant and we look at all the symbolism, we don't have to work hard for it. It's all in there. A story, you know, from Genesis to Revelation over thousands of years and 66 books and I think maybe 40 authors and it all points to him. What great confidence we have in the prophecies made sure. So now, let's think about those big hairy problems. And we're told, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And uh, we think of, of Peter when he got out of the boat, right? And the waves, they were real waves. Jesus walking on the water. He says, let me come to you. He's walking on the water. And then it says, he took his eyes off the Lord and on the waves. The children of Israel, they were just doing what they were told to do. Be courageous. Be strong. Follow me. That's what we're told to do too. And Jesus says, look, even if the water sweeps you away, no matter what happens in this life, I go and I prepare a place for you. So even, you know, you think about the worst possible thing would be that you don't survive it. But he's prepared a better place for us. And so uh, it's a little bit like looking at that river. Yeah, Jesus said, I prepared a place for me, but hey, wait a minute. Do I really believe that? That's the whole thing of faith. And notice that they weren't asked to uh, have this like uh, ill-founded faith, not just like, hey, what are we going to do? Hey, let's show up at the river and see what happens. They were told this is exactly how it's going to be. It was prophetic to them. This is how it's going to be. You're going into the promised land. You're going to see this. And when you see the, the, the water stopped in the Jordan, then you're going to know that God is with you. And he's going to wipe out all your enemies, the Canaanites. When you see this, you're going to know that's true. And so that's kind of where we're at. What's the one thing that has kept men in bondage since time immemorial? It's death. And Jesus says, look, uh, I took that curse for you. And, and I'm going to raise up on the third day. And I'm going to show you that I am greater than death. And because I go, you can come also. And I want you to be where I am. So trust me in this, even with your life's breath. Trust me. And it's not a blind trust. We can, we can look back. We can say, hey, there's lots of reasons to believe that grave was empty. There's all the reasons in the prophecies in the Old Testament. There's all the uh, example of the, the testimony of his disciples that after they saw the risen Lord, they were willing to offer up their lives to proclaim the truth. And then there's 2,000 years of people would say, my life's been changed. And still, there's Christians who choose to live in the wilderness. And still, there's Christians who, you know what, I'm not ready to take that step into the river. I, I don't, you know, I know I should pray with my family. I, I know I should reach out and share my faith. I know I should give of my first fruits. 
I, I know these things I should do, but I think I'll just stay here with what's familiar in the wilderness. And God's going, walk with me, follow me, be strong and courageous. I got your problems. In the world, you will have tribulation. Yeah, it's going to be all around. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And the word tells us, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Let's pray. Father, you were excited to see this generation in Israel because the leaders wanted to follow you and the people wanted to follow you. And Lord, we know in our experience, in our own lifetimes, that every time we take that step of faith and commitment to you, we count the cost and we follow you. Every time we give up a familiar sin that just entangles and ensnares us, every time we realize, oh, I can't even do this. I can't even do this on my own. And we invite your Holy Spirit, hey, just walk with me through it. Carry, lead me through it that you empower us and we don't regret it. Lord, I have heard a lot of regrets in my life and have my own, but I've never heard someone say, you know what? I, I felt like I pursued Jesus too much. I missed out on too much. Never heard it, Lord. And we know it in our hearts, Lord, that you have come uh, to love us and your word and your commands and your promises. They might seem risky, but they're the safest place to be in the will of God. So we ask that you would take us, Lord, that you would, uh, Lord, we just invite your Holy Spirit to convict us. Convict us of the things that you want us to leave in the wilderness. Lift our heads and remind us that you want us to take the promised land. And uh, maybe there's people at work that they're intimidating us. Lord, you want us to take, that's ours. All authority has been given to us, Lord. Go and make disciples. Lord, you want us to walk with confidence and head, heads high because we are children of the King. And so, Lord, we just pray that we can have the confidence of this generation of Joshua as uh, we go out today and be the church. Amen.